Good morning, everyone. Hey, I want to welcome all of you at our different locations. And if you didn't hear the news, uh, Kailua High School was shut down this weekend. They anticipated using the school as a shelter for Hurricane Lane. Uh, and so we cannot have services at Kailua High School this weekend. So guess what? Our New Hope Windward Kailua Ohana is in the house here in Kaneohe. Let's give it up for our Kailua folks. Woo! Waimanalo represent! Woo! Yeah, so good to see you guys. And um, man, I just want to thank all of you who are attending at Kailua. And I want to give a special mahalo and appreciation to our Kailua leaders and volunteers. You guys work so hard week in, week out. And because of your time, your use of your gifts and talents there, uh, people are getting saved, lives are being changed, and we honor you. So, Kaneohe, would you show your appreciation to our Kailua volunteers? You guys are awesome. Thank you so, so much. So if you're new to our church or you've been away, we've been in what's called 21 Days of Prayer. We've spent the last 14 days praying through this prayer guide, which, by the way, is available at guest services if you'd like to pick it up. <clears throat> Inside the guide are these scripture prayers, and man, they've been so good. Uh, for, in fact, 900 of you are going through this right now, so just imagine 900 plus people are praying the same prayers together in unity. And listen, when, when God's people come together and they pray the same prayers in unity, uh, that agreement releases so much of God's prayer. Literally thousands of prayers are going to be answered over the coming months and years because of this 21 days of prayer. So great job with that. And so um, <clears throat> it's been really good. And, and one of the things we've been having you guys pray for, that you would invest in and invite people who've drifted away from church. So maybe you served in a ministry, some people kind of in their busyness stopped coming to church, or maybe it's friends, family, or people who've never come to church, coworkers, neighbors, whoever. We've been asking you to pray every single day for 21 days for them. And so I'll tell you real quick, I've been praying for a couple people. And this week I, I knew, okay, I've invested prayers. Now I need to invite so I text uh, this person I know. I said, hey, how's it going? been thinking about you. And they're like, oh, hey, hey, great to hear from you. And I said, hey, so I've been thinking about you. Is there anything I've been praying for you about? And they said, well, as a matter of fact, yeah, pray that we come back to church. And I was like, wow. And <clears throat> they said, our kids' sports have been a poor excuse for us to skip church so much. And I thought, wow, I didn't even have to convict them. <laughs> and, and, um, and then I said, well, hey, we have a series called Overcomer coming up. And I think you and your family would really get a lot out of it. And so we invite you to that. And guess what? They're going to be coming. And so it was just like, man, I'm so glad that we're praying. And so I want to encourage you. You've been praying for 14 days. Keep praying for those that you're praying for. And then this week, reach out to those people and just offer to pray for them, check in with them, how's it going, and uh, see if God may use you to guide them back to Him. So, wanted to thank you for that and encourage you to do that. So, we've been in a series called, I Want to Believe God, But, and we've been looking at what are the things that keep us from fully trusting God? What are the things that keep us from believing that God is caring and loving, that He's a good God? And today we're going to talk about one of the biggest barriers that keeps people from believing that God is good, that he's caring, and that he's trustworthy. And so here's the question that people have asked me as a pastor over and over and over. They say, Dave, why do bad things happen to good people? Have you ever asked that question? I have. Because let's be honest, if we were God... Only good things would happen to good people. And, and that's, I mean, wouldn't we do that? If you were God, wouldn't you just make it where only good things happen to good people? Yes or no? Yes. Anybody? Like four of you? Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, if I were God, man, only good things would happen to good people and, and uh, bad things would happen to bad people. <laughs> and it reminds me of this news report that I read, a true story about this woman named Vera Svirmak. Uh, she dis she's from Czechoslovakia, and she discovered that her husband was cheating on her. He was having an affair. So in her hurt and her despair, she contemplated murdering her husband. And she decided, I'm not going to do that. But in her despair and depression, she decided that she would attempt to take her own life through suicide. 
So here's what she did. She jumped out of her third story apartment window blindly. She didn't look down below. And unknowingly, her cheating husband was right below her. She lands on him and kills him. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And she only, she didn't die. She had minor injuries. <laughs> You're like, I don't care what you say. That is hilarious. And, and I just thought, man, that, that's, that's, if I were God, that's what I would do. You know? Like, I would just have lightning bolts strike bad people, or I'd just fit, send some Czech woman to land on them, you know, and wipe them out. But, but think about it. Like, if we were God, wouldn't we only want good things to happen to good people? I mean, faithful spouses would have these fairy tale marriages, and good people would never have any physical pain or suffering. If we were God, think about how our jobs would be. Our jobs would be problem-free our co-workers would never irritate us. And we'd all make choke money, huh? You guys want me to be God? Gosh, the last service wanted me to be God after that. So the reality is, is bad things happen to good people. And because of this, a lot of times we start to question God, especially when that, those bad things are happening to us. When we're going through evil and suffering, that's when we can question God's goodness. And, and, and some of you may be thinking, that, you know, Dave, I've been praying. I've been trying to believe in God fully, but these bad things are still happening. Or you're saying, I want to believe God is trustworthy and caring, but all this drama and all these prayers are going unanswered. And if I'm just honest, Dave, sometimes I question how much God really cares. And if that's you, I want you to know I have felt the exact same way at times when I've gone through suffering and pain. So why do bad things happen to good people? And uh, let's actually see that this is a question that was asked by one of the wisest people who ever lived named Solomon. And here's what he said. He said, here's something that happens all the time, and it makes no sense at all to me, he says. Bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. He's going, I don't get that. And so if you've ever asked that question, you're in good company because the wisest person who ever walked this planet besides Jesus asked the same question. And so why do bad things happen to good people? Well, let's, let's allow God to answer that. So I'm going to share with you his answer through scriptures. I would encourage you to take notes today because I think you'll find this helpful. Here are three reasons why bad things happen to good people. Number one, some bad things are the result of our own what? Sin. So for example, if I cheat on my spouse, it would be no mystery to me if she left me. It just wouldn't be. Why? Because my own sin caused that tear in our relationship. If I drink too much, eat too many wrong foods, it's not a mystery if I get health problems and die prematurely. It's from my own sin, from not taking care of my health. If I misuse my words in anger and I lash out, it's no mystery that there would be a wedge between me and the person I got really angry at. It's from my own sin. So some of the bad things that happen to good people is because of our own sin. Here's another reason why bad things happen to good people, if you're taking notes. It's because of other people's sin. <clears throat> so, for instance, if you're dating somebody and they cheat on you, that's, that's not your fault. That's their own sin. If, if somebody's abusive to you, that's their choice. That's their sin. If <clears throat> your kids are making self-destructive decisions and that's bringing suffering on your life as a parent, that's not your sin. That's your kid's decision. So if we, if we stop and think about a lot of the suffering and hardships we go through, a lot of it's because of other people's sin. Isn't that right? But here's another reason that we go through pain and suffering, and a lot of people don't think about this because, and you'll see why here in a moment, and if you're taking notes, here it is. Some bad things are a result of, say it with me out loud, Satan's attacks. Now, let's see where we find this in Scripture. It's in numerous Scriptures in the Bible, but let me just show you one. <clears throat> Ephesians 6. 
For our fight is not against any physical enemy. Our fight is against organizations and powers that are spiritual. We are up against the unseen power that controls this dark world and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of what? Evil. And so there is an unseen power. This is why a lot of people don't believe in spiritual warfare. They don't believe in the devil because it's unseen. But let's just look around the world. Is there a lot of evil in this world? Yeah, it's because Satan attacks. And while Satan has limited power in this world, he still causes a lot of pain and suffering. And I'll just tell you, as a pastor of a church, I have experienced intense and heavy suffering from spiritual attacks. And many of you have too. In fact, we read about some of Satan's attacks in the life of Job, and we see ways that Satan can attack us. So in the Old Testament, here's what happened to Job. Satan comes and attacks Job's life. And the first thing that Satan attacks is his finances. He bankrupts him. He affects his career. There's some suffering. Some of you are going through financial hardships because Satan has attacked you financially. Then... Satan attacks Job's family, and, and Job experiences the tragic death of his 10 children all dying in one day. If you think losing one person's hard, try losing all 10 of your kids in one day. If that wasn't bad enough, Satan attacks his health, and Job has these boils all over his body, and he's itching, and he's in extreme pain and misery. And the Bible doesn't tell us how long he suffered, but as you read Job, he suffered for 36 long chapters. It was a long, long time of physical suffering. And, and people go, well, why did, why did Job get attacked? Question, did Job get attacked because of his own sin? No, the Bible says he was righteous. <clears throat> did Job get attacked because of other people's sin? No. The person who attacked Job was... Satan. And <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the Bible assures us that one day is coming when evil will come to an end. So I have some good news for you in the midst of hearing about Satan's attacks. One day God will put a stop and the workers of wickedness will be stopped. Can I hear a good amen? amen. <clears throat> so here's where we read about this. There's other places too. Proverbs 11. Count on this. The wicked won't get off scot-free, and God's loyal people will triumph. And so you hang in there. You keep fighting the good fight for God. You keep pressing on even when you're attacked. It is worth it. But there is a place where God will deal with evil, and that place is called hell. And it's mentioned all throughout the Bible. And I remember a person talking about this. I heard this story about this young bride and just moments before her wedding, she's crying, she's sobbing. And so her, the mother of the bride comes in and she's like, what's wrong, honey? And the, this bride was a very religious person. She says, mom, I believe everything in the Bible. And I've just learned that my fiance, Johnny, he doesn't believe in hell. <laughs> oh, mom, what are we going to do? When the mom sat there silently and after a moment, she said, you marry him anyways, and we'll show him hell. <laughs> That's hilarious. <clears throat> and so one of the reasons bad things happen to good people is because of mother-in-laws. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. My, this is a joke. Don't, don't elbow her. Uh, no, no, no. One of the reasons bad things happen to good people is because Satan attacks. Okay, so then here's what people say. I've asked this. If God is caring, why didn't God create the world without pain and suffering? That's a good question. And the answer is, according to Scripture, God did create the earth without pain and suffering in the beginning. Let's talk about this. As you read the book of Genesis, you find out that the earth was perfect, at one point, there was no sin, there was no pain, there was zero suffering, no grief, no bifocals, no balding, no bulges. Come on. <laughs> it was a perfect place. But then God created man and woman. 
And, and God says to Adam and Eve, hey, you guys can do whatever you want here, but you see that tree there? Don't eat any of the fruit off that. Don't do that. And they're like, <sighs> and they got tempted. And what did they do? <sniffs> they ate the fruit. And all of a sudden, the Bible says the earth was cursed and thorns and thistles entered into this planet. All of a sudden, our planet became broken. And it's, the planet's not only broken, but the people became broken as well. This is a big reason why there, why there is evil and suffering. It's from other people's sin. And so when the planet got corrupted, it became out of sync. And so ever since the planet became out of sync, we've had droughts, we've had floods, we've had wars, we've had earthquakes, we've had terrorism, we've had tornadoes, we've had viruses, fires, illnesses, diseases, evil, suffering, and hurricanes. Thank you, hurricanes. And so, so much of our suffering comes from this broken planet, which the Bible says one day will be renewed. There will be a renewed earth, and it will be restored uh, when Jesus comes back to perfection, and that's going to be a good day. Would you agree with that? So, so, so much of our suffering is because people use their free will in selfish and sinful ways. Let me, let me give you an example of this. So here I have a knife. And this knife can be used for good. Uh, I can use this to cut bread. And that's a good use of this knife. I can use my free will to cut bread, feed myself and others. It's like, ah, that's good. But I can also use this same knife to take another person's life. So this knife can be used for good, or because of my free will, I can choose to use it for evil. I could use this knife to take my own life. Ah, no worries. I've been waiting all day to do that. That was so fun. Okay. <clears throat> Things I do to keep you awake. So, 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 so much of the evil and suffering happens from people using their freedom to choose in sinful ways. Isn't that right? Okay. So it has been estimated that 95% of the evil and suffering in this world is a result of people using their free will in selfish and sinful ways. And you know what? Let's just be honest. We've all done it too. Have you ever sinned? Wow, you like big time sinners. <laughs> we all are sinners, and we've all sinned, and some of our sinful choices have caused suffering in other people. And so we've all done it, but 95% of suffering, they say, is the result of selfishness and sinful ways. For example, let's look at the famines around the world. Do you ever watch these, these documentaries on TV and you see these people dying of starvation and you're like, oh my gosh, God, why don't you do something about it? These people are dying of malnutrition. Did you know that there is enough food on this planet to feed every man, woman, and child where they would have 3,000 calories a day? There's already enough food on this planet today to feed every man, woman, and child with 3,000 calories of food. So God is saying, I have solved the starvation issue but you guys need to feed them. But what happens is in our world, because of nationalism, because of selfishness and sinfulness, people don't care. And so some people take more food and don't feed others. And, and as a result, because here's my point, as a result of our own sinfulness and selfishness as a, as a humanity, people die of starvation. And yet we blame God for it. God's going, I provided all the food. You guys are using your free will not to feed them. So much of our suffering is from other people. Yet, how many people blame God for most of the suffering in the world? And so much of it comes from others. So have you ever wondered this? Well, well, didn't God know that all this evil and suffering would happen? I mean, he knew that people would rebel against him. He knew that, that there would be evil and suffering and pain. And so why would he go ahead and create this world with free will if he knew we would use our free will in bad ways? Well, let me give you a few examples why. First of all, God is love. God's greatest priority, as you read the Bible, is love. It's his primary goal that we become love because God is love. 
And real love involves a choice. You cannot love somebody unless you choose to love them. So what God could have done, like let's say, for instance, my wife Lisa. God could have removed her free will and all of yours, and he programmed us to just do what he says. So he removes our freedom to choose, and then Lisa's like, I love you, Dave Barr, because God's making me love you. (laughs) That's not real love. That's lame love. But instead, God gave her free will. She had the freedom to choose. And so out of three billion men on this planet, she looked at me and said, I like Mary, that handsome holly. I like Bewit, that former Chippendale dancer. <laughs> Just kidding, I was not a Chippendale dancer. <laughs> and so she chose me. She could have cho- chosen not me. <laughs> But instead, she chose moi. (laughs) And that means the world to me. Because she used her freedom to choose to love me. Now, this, this is the reason I tell you that example. Because this is why God gave you free will. Do you realize how meaningful it is to God that you've chosen to love him? You have this free will to ignore him, to blow him off, to disobey him, and yet you choose to love him. That means far more to him than my wife loving me means to me. And it means a lot to me. It means so much that you've chosen to love God. Let me give you another example why God's given us freedom to choose. Those of you who are parents, think about it this way, okay? Didn't we all know before we had kids that there was a real possibility that our kids would endure some type of suffering and pain and hardship and disappointment in life? Didn't we know that before we had kids? They're going to experience some of that. Didn't we know that our kids might even at times reject our instructions and make us mad? And that they might even reject us and walk away from us for a season? We knew that, yet we still decided to have them. What were we thinking? (laughs) And here's why. We went ahead and had kids anyway because we knew that there was tremendous potential for the joy of having relationship with them. We knew there would be times that they would be loving us. Mama, Dada. Times when they'd come home even as adult children and go, I love you. Times that we could be Ohana and family and we could get through difficulties together and not grow further apart, but closer together. We knew that, so we chose to have kids. And that, my friends, is why God decided to still have this planet full of people, even though he knew that some would choose to reject him and that there would be pain and suffering. It was worth it for him. And so then how should we respond to suffering? Stop and think about it. What should you do if you go through chronic physical pain where day in, day out, you're in physical pain? How should you respond to that suffering? What should you do if you're going through suffering at work month upon month, maybe even year upon year, and you're just driving into work going, God, don't make me go there another day. How do you handle that suffering? What do you do if you're going through relational suffering and and, and you're having all these arguments and struggles and discouragement and disappointments and fights and you're going, gosh, I, I can't take it anymore. How do you handle relational suffering? How do you handle financial suffering? Job had his finances attacked. We can get our finances attacked. We can go through financial struggles. So how do we handle that? Well, let's see what God says to do. And what I did was I decided to put God's word into phrases because I thought about, I thought this is what I've said during the times that I've gone through suffering and this has helped me so much in in reinforcing God's word and it's been encouraging. So I would encourage you to take notes. Listen, some of you aren't going through suffering right now and let me tell you, take some notes because you don't know what tomorrow holds. And so take some notes. I think you'll find this quite helpful. Number one, Here's the first thing you need to say when you're suffering. While I'm suffering, say it with me, I will get 
better. Everybody, not bitter. Now, this is so important because when you're suffering, it's very easy to get bitter and not better. We actually see this in Job's life. Now, Job is suffering. His wife is suffering. All of her kids have died. And I want you to see how Job's wife gets bitter. Take a look at this. She says to Job, Job's wife says to him, are you still holding on to your faith? Why don't you just curse God and die? That's a person who's bitter. And Job could have very well chosen to do this in his physical suffering and in the loss of his family and his finances. But instead, as you read the book of Job, you see that he hung in there and he fought the good fight. And you know what? Job got better, not bitter. And here's the good news. When you choose to allow suffering to make you better, not bitter, here, listen, God's going to bless you for it. If you study Job, Job got blessed big time. He got blessed with a bunch of new kids. How many of you want new kids? No, just kidding. <laughs> That's funny. I want that. No. <laughs> he got blessed with, a new, uh, with major finances. He became, the Bible says, super wealthy. And so listen, while you're suffering, don't get bitter, get better. And God's blessings will follow. Amen? <clears throat> so then let's talk about some ways that suffering can make us better. If you're taking notes, here's what the Bible says. Number one, suffering draws me closer to God if I allow it to. We see this with Paul, 2 Corinthians 1. It says, and some of you may feel this way in a problem. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought that we would never live through it. In fact, these problems, this suffering is so bad, we expected to die. Some of you feel that way. But as a result of this suffering, watch this, we stopped relying on ourselves and we learned through the suffering to say it with me, everyone, rely only on God. Listen, suffering can be one of the greatest teachers to teach you to rely on God solely. Because when God is all you got, you realize God is all you need. And so you say, God, I'm going to allow this suffering to make me better, not bitter. And I'm not going to run from you. I'm not going to like blame you for everything. I'm going to draw closer to you, God. And you know what? You wouldn't be sitting there right now in this service if you hadn't allowed suffering to draw you closer to God. So you've already done this. Keep it up. Because in those times when it's prolonged suffering, the enemy will tempt you and say, oh, is he really a good God? Wow. You can allow that to happen. But you hang in there and you just say, you know what? I'm going to get better, not bitter. And one day God's going to bless me for stewarding this suf suffering well, Satan. So take that one. <laughs> He's such a jerk. <laughs> he is. <clears throat> so... Um, Here's another question I want you to ask yourself while you've, you've been in pain. Have you ever wanted to ask God while you're in pain, God, what are you doing? God, why aren't you doing anything? Have you ever felt like God's not working while you're suffering? Well, the Bible tells us that God works all the time. And so God is working while you're suffering. And there's many things he, he does. Let me show you a couple things. You can write this down. First of all, while you're suffering, God's working on your character and your calling should write that down. This is a big reason, a big thing God works on why we are suffer while we're suffering. James 1, dear brothers and sisters at New Hope Windward, is your life full of difficulties? You got dramas at work? You hate that jerk at work? How about that person sitting next to you? No, <laughs> is your life full of difficulties and temptations? They're like, yeah. He's all, then be happy. What? Why should I be happy? For when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. And watch this. So let it grow. I love this. And don't try to squirm out of your problems. <laughs> he says, for when your patience is finally full bloom, then you will be, say it with me, ready for anything. Strong in character, full and complete. Listen, some of you are going through suffering right now. And you need to say, I'm going to get better, not bitter. My character, my calling is being secured. I'm being trained through pain. And one day, my patience is going to be really strong. It's not right now. But it's going to get stronger. And I'll be ready to handle anything that comes my way. 
Now think about it. Hasn't there been times in your past when you went through problems and it prepared you to handle future problems that you've gone through better? I mean, I remember in my early years in my job, in my early 20s working, and it was like, man, these problems are so hard. Well, guess what? I become a pastor here. I go through the same work problems. And I'm like, dang, why are these problems following me? They're just with different people. But it was like, this is different. Been there, done that. I can handle this because God got me through that. He's going to get me through this. Let's go. You see what I mean? Because I've already been there. It wasn't round one in the octagon. It was like round two. Been there, done that. Let's go. I got more, I've got more of God's wisdom in this. I've seen him help me through it. We've got this. Let's go. So God will allow your suffering to train you and prepare you. Some of the problems you're going through, listen, it's preparing you for your calling. It's preparing you for some of God's assignments that he has for you. Uh, Many of you know of Pastor Rick and Kay Warren, and and many of you know that their son Matthew uh, took his own life a few years ago after a lifelong battle of dealing with a mental illness that tortured him in his entire life. So in a moment of weakness, he took his own life through suicide. Devastating Rick and Kay as it would any parent. Rick and Kay decided not to get bitter. They decided to allow that to make them better. And they said, God, don't waste this pain. Use it to help others. And now guess what they do? They have one of the largest mental health ministries in the world. They allowed the pain to be used for good. In fact, if you want, uh, Kay Warren's actually coming here to Kaneohe in September for the mental health conference. If you'd like to participate, you can sign up online. I'm going to be there and many others. Some of you have been struggling with mental health issues. Others of you have a family member who does. I think you might find it helpful. But here's my point. God will not waste your hurts if you let him use your hurts. You've heard me say this before. Who can better help an alcoholic than a former alcoholic? Who can better help a family who has a child who's wayward than another family who's been through it where their child went south? If you will let God use you, he will take your pain and use it for a purpose. And can I just tell you that some of the greatest suffering I've gone through my life, when God has used it to help others, it's brought me some of the greatest joy in my life. Here's why. Because I go, wow, God, all that suffering was was not a waste. It trained me. It prepared me. I saw your goodness through it all, even when I doubted you at times. And now you're giving hope and comfort to others through my pain. Thank you, God. Thank you. Don't let God, don't leave your hurts just to yourself. This is why, can I tell you, this is why it's so important for you to be in a small group. Because you get in a small group and all these people come in and, and they're going through some problem and you're like, hey, I've been through that. And they're like, really? I thought it was just me. No, no, I've been through that. Well, tell me, what did you do? Well, here's what I learned through it and here's what God did. Here's a few, a few verses he gave me and I'm telling you, you're going to get through it. Really? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let God use you. If you want to get in a small group, in fact, Overcomers coming up, man, clear your calendar. Get in an Overcomer small group. You can pick up the resources next Sunday and let God use your hurts because suffering can prepare your character and your calling. Amen? All right, here's the next point. Write this down, really important. Here's what to say when you're suffering. While I'm suffering, everybody say it with me. God is helping me. <laughs> now, this one you got to say sometimes because you're going to be like, I don't feel like he's helping But he is. In fact, look at this verse. I love this verse. Great promise. God is our protection and source of strength. He was always ready to what? Help us in our times of trouble, in our times of suffering. When you turn to God in your suffering and you follow him as best as you can, he promises, I will help you. And so when I'm in suffering, I'll just say, you know what? While I'm suffering, God is helping me. Sometimes he's just helping you get through the day. Sometimes he's helping you to not get bitter. Sometimes he's helping you say the right words to somebody. Sometimes he's helping provide other people to help you. Sometimes there's a myriad of ways that he will help you while you're suffering. And so you need to know that while you're suffering, 
God is helping you and he will provide you exactly what you need to help you get through what you're going through. Can you say amen to that? Okay, here's the last thing I want you to write down. Is while I'm suffering, God is still good. Now, I, I actually had, I didn't write this till yesterday, and um, I just felt like God was like, Dave, there are times that you and others doubt my goodness when this suffering is long-term and it's really painful. I'm like, that's so true. About a year ago, um, my dad had a colonoscopy, and they found a benign polyp inside, and it wasn't cancerous. The doctor said, you can leave it, but I recommend you remove it. And because if you don't remove this polyp in your dad, then it could turn cancerous. And so we all prayed, and, and all of us and, and lots of people prayed. Every single person who prayed, we're talking mature, godly believers, we all felt like God was saying, go ahead and have the surgery. We had tremendous peace. We had enormous faith that everything would go fine. The doctor even said, I've never lost anybody in this surgery. It's a standard procedure. Nobody's ever died when I've done this surgery. So we all said, okay, let's have the surgery. So a year ago, my dad had the surgery, and nine days later, he died from the surgery. And I'll never forget the morning. It was a Saturday morning, and... And my dad was, uh, he, he lived in Tucson at the time, and so he was in a Tucson hospital, and my mom said, your dad just died, and I was shocked. I, I was like, what? He died? What? No, God said he was going to be fine. All of us had peace. And she said, please get on a plane and come home. So you got it. I'm coming right now. And the first thing I said to God was, I said, you are so mean for doing this. I can't believe you didn't tell us that you were going to allow him to die. You're so cruel in this. Now, some of you are going, oh, I can't believe you said that, Pastor. I'm just being honest. That's how I felt in the moment. And I got on the plane, and I was just sobbing, and God, why? Why'd you do this? And you know what? God didn't give me an explanation. Instead, he asked me a question. So I'm sitting in the place and why did you allow this? Why didn't you heal him? You could have healed. Why didn't you just tell us not to have the surgery? And here's what he said. He said, son, have I been good to you? It's like, And I just stopped and I started thinking about my entire life. Because what he said literally was, he said, in my mind, he said, have I been good to you your entire life? And I thought, if you look at the totality of my life, there are thousands of things that God has done for me. (laughs) He's provided me food, shelter, and clothing for all the days of my life. Hot showers. I've had a car. He's provided me some jobs, relationships. He's provided me this amazing church. He he helped me meet his son. He's answered numerous prayers. Now, I'll be honest, he's also said no to many prayers. I've also been through a lot of pain and suffering. But he just asked me, have I been good to you over the entirety of your life? And I was like, the, the answer was like, yeah. I said, you've been so good to me. And then he said this, then trust in my goodness. And he said nothing else. In other words, son, have I been good to you? Yes. Well, then you need to trust that I'm a good God. I'm a good, good father because that's who I am. I've shown you that I'm good and I'm going to be good in this and you don't need to know the reasons why. Trust me. And this verse came to mind. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In other words, Dave, when you don't understand it, you choose to trust God and his goodness with all of your heart. And then in all your ways going forward in this loss, Dave, and this suffering, acknowledge God, include him, 
Lean on him, depend on him, and he will make this path straight, these many paths straight. And I can stand here a year after this, and I can tell you the grieving has been super hard at times. Watching my mom be widowed, and because she has a lot of physical issues, has been so painful to see. I've cried, I've grieved, but I can tell you this, God has been so good in the suffering, in the grieving. He was good before, he was good after. So often we ask God, God, why? Why are you allowing this? And can I tell you, it's okay to ask God why. Jesus hung on the cross in the worst pain and suffering of his life, and he said, my God, my God, why? Why? Why have you forsaken me? It's okay to ask God why. But when God doesn't provide an explanation, it's okay. Here's why. If God gives you an explanation for your suffering, it's not going to take your pain away. I'm going to say that again. If God gives you an explanation of your suffering, it won't take your pain away. It just is an explanation. The pain still remains. So here's what I've learned. I don't need God's explanations to get through suffering well. I need God's promises to get through suffering well. I don't need to get bitter in suffering. I need to get better in suffering. I don't need to run away from God. I need to run closer and draw near to Him. I don't need to like go crazy and become a rebel. I need to allow the suffering to change my character and prepare me more for my calling so God can use the suffering for his glory. So God can then say, I am the great I am. I am the great comforter. I am the great protector. I will be with you for with whatever you're going through. You hold on to me. I will never let go of you with my righteous right hand, God says, because I will be with you forever and ever. I will never leave you or abandon me. So run to me. Turn to me, be with me, and you will get through this, and I will strengthen you and help you no matter what you're going through. God says that to you. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 He's a great God. He's a good God. Let's pray. Let's talk to this good, good Father of ours. Let's talk to him. Let's bow our heads, all of our locations. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. And this is one of those topics that's difficult, God, because we've all been through some level of pain and suffering. And God, you've reminded us today that some of the suffering's from our own sin. And so, Father, we ask, please forgive us for the suffering we've caused ourselves and the suffering we've caused others because of our own selfish and sinful choices. Forgive us, God. Cleanse our hearts. Make us new. And God, sometimes bad things happen to good people because of other people's sins. And God, in those moments, we can get bitter towards others and not forgive them and get full of resentment. So right now, Jesus, we are going to choose not to get bitter, but better. We're going to choose to get better by choosing to forgive those who've wronged us, those who've brought suffering in our life. We choose to release them, and we're going to let you settle the score, Jesus. Thank you for the freedom that comes from choosing to forgive. And God, sometimes we go through suffering because Satan attacks. And we thank you, God, that if we steward that suffering well, that if we don't become bitter, but we become better, you will bless us for that as you bless Job. And so, God, you have some amazing suffering saints in this audience, people who steward suffering so well. And I pray, Jesus, you bless them for managing that suffering in godly ways. I pray, God, you use their pain and their hurts for your glory. God, thank you that you never waste a hurt if we let you use it. That you will build our character. You will prepare us for our calling. And I pray, God, you release these amazing saints to use their pain, use their suffering, use what you taught them to help hundreds and hundreds with the comfort and love and power and wisdom of Christ. Use them, God. And God, while we are suffering, even those times we doubt your goodness, we will declare 
that you are still good even when we're suffering. And God, you have been good to all of us. We know that. You just demolished Hurricane Lane. That's good. And you've done far more than that to us as people here. So God, we trust in your goodness. And while we're suffering, you are still so good. And we rest in that. We declare that. Seal that to our hearts, Lord. As your heads are bowed, if you're suffering, the most important step for you to take is to invite Jesus Christ into your life. Because when you do, he will put his Holy Spirit in you. And that spirit will help you suffer well. That spirit will help you do what we're talking about today. So if you've never invited him in, it's a free gift. You don't earn it. You just receive it. And he'll gladly come into your life and lead you as much as you let him. So if you've never invited him in, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. We're all going to pray it out loud as a church family. You can join us in this prayer. So church family, let's pray this. Say these words with me. Jesus Christ, I turn from my sins and I turn to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Strengthen me. Cleanse me. Make me new. Help me suffer well for your glory. Use my suffering for your purposes. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen? Amen. Let's congratulate those who prayed that prayer. Good job, you guys. You're an amazing church. Those of you who prayed that prayer, uh, we have a free gift for your guest services, and it's called Next Step Packet. You can pick that up after service. Uh, Also, at guest services, you can pick up the 21 Days of Prayer Guide. If any of you like to join in on that, it's not too late. And then um, some of you might like some additional prayer because of what you're going through. We've had a lot of people come to our prayer team in front of Theater 4. They'd love to pray for you privately if you'd like that. Um, Two things I want to mention. Don't forget to invite your friends to church, uh, the ones you've been praying for. So make some plans this week to text or reach out to them and see how God uses you. And then last but not least, next Sunday we will finish I Want to Believe God, but... And we're going to do something a little different. We're going to actually do the service next Sunday like we're going to do Overcomer. So I got a movie next week that we're going to show many clips from. And we're going to see how we can believe God better as we teach God's word with some support from these movie clips. So we'll give you a little preview of Overcomer. So hope you can make it next week. Thank you guys. Being awesome. Thanks for your support. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.